I want to live a passionate life. I think any other type of life is kind of boring, don't you think? And I don't want to be bored, and I want to be excited about the things of God. I want to be excited about life. I want to be excited in my marriage. I want to be excited in my family. I want to be excited for my church. And so that requires us living a passionate life. And what we have determined is that passion isn't an emotion. It is a choice. I could choose to be passionate. That God has given us something called a free will, and you have the decision-making power to be passionate. But at times, life will come and interfere or distract us from our passion. And so I titled this morning's message, Passion is Urgency. Passionate people are urgent people. And can I tell you something? Um, I completely adore my wife. I do. She's standing right there. I'm not just trying to get brownie points. I'm just speaking the truth. I adore my wife. I love her to death. However... One of the things that we're working on. Anybody got stuff you're working on in your marriage? One of the things, oh, yeah. <laughs> Be careful, you're right next to her. Um, but what we're working on is, like, I'm trying to help her define what urgency is, all right? And maybe some of the men in the room could, could, could empathize with me right now. She's like, whenever your wife screams for you, right, what do you want to do? As a man, you want to come to the rescue, right? You want to run. What happened? Who did it, right? You come in with your bat. Right? Every Puerto Rican has a bat in their house. Where do you have it? Where do you have it, Nick? Under your bed. Under your bed, right? Pre-Jesus, I had a knife in my boot all the time. But now I just have a bat. And so sometimes she'll scream, babe, babe, come here. And I'm like, what? So-and-so is pregnant. Look. And I'm like, I don't, what? Why are you yelling at me like that? Because so-and-so is pregnant. Or, oh, my God, honey, you got to see this. And I come and look, look, isn't he cute? Like, shows me a baby picture or something like that. Yes, like, what the heck? Like, stop screaming. Or the worst was that she is actually screaming. And she's like, you got to come here, you got to come here. And I'm like, what? There's a spider in the shower. And I'm like, babe, that is not an emergency. Stop treating things. And then my boys, my boys have followed her footsteps. I'm not exaggerating. My son, all of a sudden, Chase, like, Dad, Dad, come here, come here. What? Look at this meme. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, like, okay, <laughs> you can't just be, like, yelling across the house in a state of urgency when it's not urgent. And because why? Because for me, I feel like it's a waste of energy. I'm coming with a big D on my chest for Super Dad, right? And it's, and it's a false alarm. It's like the boy who cried wolf, right? And I'm like, you got to keep things that are urgent, urgent. And I think a lot of times when it comes to our passion, it comes to our walk with God, it comes to the things that we, we hold value about, like, you know, in your families, in your marriages, I think the thing that robs you of your passion is wasted energy towards things that are not urgent and not important. Can I get an amen? Those are the things that will rob you of your energy. When someone declares urgency, 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 this is important, this is important, this is important, and it's not important. And in fact, I f- fully believe that by the end of this sermon, that some of us, we're going to make some shifts. There are going to be things in, in, on our list of urgency that aren't so urgent, and then things that we've kind of ignored that actually feed our passion, that we're going to slide over here, like, you know, this is an urgent matter, and it requires my attention. So I want to read a story from the, the book of Mark. It's what I call the ADD gospel. This is four Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And if you ever read Mark and if you understand what I'm talking about, it's my favorite Gospel because it's always like immediately. And then it's like a high energy Gospel because all the ADD people who's with me, we need that kind of fast moving pace stuff. And so Mark's kind of like that. And and so we're going to pick up a chapter two. And it tells a story about these five dudes that had an urgent issue. All right. Five dudes that had an urgent issue. We're going to pick up, and it said this. And when he, meaning Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Everybody say, at home. Say, at home, those people who hate repeating stuff that the preacher says. Say, at home. <laughs> like, really? Do I have to repeat you? I came here to hear you preach, not me. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room. Okay, so he's at home. He had a house party all of a sudden. <laughs> There wasn't even enough room, not even at the door, the Bible says. I grew up, again, in a Spanish house. Sort of, and my mother, um, the house was always full of people. She just always had an open invite, and she was the, what I call the kitchen counselor. 
right? So whenever Dee Dee, that's my mom's say, whenever Dee Dee invites you to the kitchen, you in trouble, all right? She's going to talk to you about your parents. She's going to talk about all the hurts and wounds in your life. You're going to get a free counseling session, and you're going to flip over some patalios. That's what you're going to do in my mom's kitchen, right? You're going to get canceled. So my house is always full, so I kind of empathize with this. And I'm an introvert, so I like it. You know, if I'm honest with you, I love people. I really do. I love people. And, you know, I'm shaking hands, and I'm talking to people and everything like that. But Sunday afternoon, I take a social coma because I just need to retreat and just refuel my tank, right, and fall asleep and watch my Jets lose. That's the routine. I got a record to prove it, 0-4, to prove it. And thank you so much that now my, our, our head quarterback is back. He recovered from the cooties. I don't know if you heard this. What kind of quarterback goes down with mono? <laughs> but now we got him back, and now we're playing the Cowboys. Where are my Cowboys fans at? All right. I digress. So Jesus came home. He's coming home, right? And then his house was full. And then what did he do? He goes, all right, if y'all are going to interrupt my rest, I'm going to preach to y'all. That's what I would do if you came to my house this afternoon. Okay. And so he was preaching the word to them. And then they came and bringing them a paralytic carried by four men. So paralyzed man carried by four men. And when they could not get near him, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. Isn't this ridiculous? They removed the roof above him. And then when they had made an opening, they let down the bed which the paralytic lay. It was like Mission Impossible style. Can you imagine this? They're like laying him down right in front of Jesus. And, and it carries on. And it says, so they let him down. And then when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes, there was a bunch of know-it-alls in the room, were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Now, there's a difference between asking a question and you having a questioning spirit towards someone. You know the difference, right? My kids, sometimes I got to check them because they'll, they won't just ask me a question. They'll have a questioning spirit. Parents know what I'm talking about, right? No, don't question me, boy, right? So they were questioning in their hearts. The Bible says, what does this man speak like? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, because Mark is an ADD gospel, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his heart that thus that question that within themselves, they said to him, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying this, we have never seen anything like this. We have never seen anything like this. So let me recap real quick. This is the scenario. Jesus comes home to his headquarters. He wants some rest. House is full of people. He starts preaching. As he's preaching, these four men, they bring in this paralyzed guy. And the house was so packed. Follow me here. The house was so packed that they couldn't even get Jesus' attention. Because prior to this, Jesus was healing. Prior to this, Jesus was preaching. They couldn't get his attention. That's how packed this house was. Because you would think, even at a, just imagine like Christmas is just around the corner. Just imagine your Christmas party. If you really wanted to, you could get someone's attention across the room, right? You know, throw a mistletoe at them or something, right? They couldn't get Jesus' attention, so this is what they did. They cut a hole in the roof of the house to make sure that this man met face-to-face with Jesus. And then Jesus does this crazy thing, because prior to this, prior to this, he just laid hands on people. You are healed. You know, let the blind see. Let the deaf hear, right? Let the jets win. He healed people all the time. And so in this moment, he doesn't say, you're healed. He says, son, your sins are forgiven, which is kind of crazy because prior to this, we see that he's healing people, and, and he didn't really necessarily make that connection to sin. There are some times where your sickness is a result of sin, and other times when your sickness or some situation in your life is just a platform for God to get the glory. But here he made that connection. He goes, son, your sins are forgiven. And then that started controversy. All these guys didn't like that at all. What do you mean your sins are forgiven? Now watch this, what we forget. So he starts attacking the religious people in the room. Meanwhile, homie's still on the floor. 
Am I reading this wrong? Homies are straight chilling, looking at, oh, really? Yeah? I'm, I'm still paralyzed, right? So he's arguing with the scribes. Then he goes, watch this. Son, take your mat, get up and walk. And then he gets up and walks. And then they were all amazed by the situation. So this is what happened. They were amazed at it. And, and Jesus says, what's easier? What's easier, me to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? In other words, I would paraphrase them like this. Listen, a miracle is a miracle. Whether it's the miracle in your heart or the miracle in your legs, a miracle is a miracle and you're missing it. You're missing it. And I think at times, every Sunday we get together, we encounter miracles. Every Sunday we get together, we see the supernatural move in this place. And I know you might not see it on the outside, but when hearts leave encouraged, come on, when people are, are, are eager to live out the hope that they receive today, that is a miracle. Somebody clap your hands this morning if you already experienced some miracles here in this place. And he said, a miracle is a miracle. And then the crazy part is, again, remember my man was sitting on the floor or laying on the floor, and the complete restoration process took a little bit to take its effect. I think what that speaks to us here today, that at times God begins something and we think, all right, this is it. Then all I have is my sins forgiven. I'm still going to walk away paralyzed. However, he starts the complete restoration process. And sometimes we have to wait. But if you hold on tight to his word, he's going to say, get up and walk one day. He's going to say, get up and walk one day. And, then, and I love the ending of the story. They never saw anything like this. They never saw anything like this. So I want to teach us this morning how to, how to read the word. And what I usually do is I, I'm a preacher, so I use alliteration a lot. And I tell people about the four C's when it comes to reading the Bible. Because sometimes we get caught up and we get one verse and we gravitate towards that one verse. And at times that's when we could take that verse out of context. But, but what we first have to do is you have to read it in its context. Don't just read one verse. Read it in its context. Read it, the paragraphs around it. See what it's really saying. So we understand the context. Then we understand what did it mean in that culture, okay? What did it mean in that culture? Because it just wasn't a big construction thing. Their roofs weren't that fortified, okay? I wish you would try to cut a hole in this wall. I'll get Steve Ramickus on you real quick. We've never seen him hawk out, but I'm pretty sure we could see him hawk out if there's a hole in the ceiling. Because <laughs> he's going to be the one in charge of fixing it. And he doesn't want that on his life, all right? But you gotta, you gotta go back and you gotta read it in its context, okay? What did it mean, culture? What did it mean, context? What did it mean in the culture at the time, right? What did it mean in the culture? We take that principle and then we say, what is that principle? How does that principle apply to my culture, this modern day culture? And then, so that's the third C. And then the, the fourth C is this every story we read from the Bible tells us more about Christ. If it doesn't lead us to Christ, then we're not reading it right. That's not only rhymes, that's dope. And it's true, all right? So we read it in this context, we read it in this culture, we read it in our culture, and then it has to tell us the story of Christ. So I have some, some principles I want us to derive from this story. The first thing is, what is your crowd? There was a crowd that got in the way between this paralyzed man and Jesus. What is your crowd? Sometimes it, you're your crowd. Sometimes you're the thing that's standing in the way between you and your breakthrough this morning. Sometimes it's religious people. Like in this story, it was the crowd that stand, that's coming in your way between you and your healing miracle with Jesus. Listen, sometimes we confuse that they prioritize coming to hear Jesus, but they didn't prioritize coming to receive from Jesus. Can I say that again? You might prioritize coming to church, but you come to church just to receive all the feel goods. But what they missed out was they came and they were hearing Jesus, but they didn't have a teachable spirit. Hello? They didn't have a teachable spirit. You don't know how you have a teachable spirit? You take notes. Let the conviction set in. You want to know how you have a teachable spirit? You consider how does this apply to your life. And sometimes the crowd, the things that interfere with us passionately pursuing Jesus is that you have given yourself permission to come and hear the word but not receive the word. So what's the crowd for you? Not only that, here's a crazy question. Why do these four men had to do it now. They could have waited until after the party was over. They felt the need to do it right now. They came with a level of urgency that many of us, sometimes including myself, lack. 
they had to do it right now. They couldn't wait any longer. They had to get this man to Jesus. The next question is like, the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith, saw their faith, and then spoke to this man. Notice, he did not, the Bible doesn't say that Jesus saw the paralyzed man's faith. It says that he saw these four men's faith and then spoke to them. What was it about their faith that, made Je- that, that amazed Jesus? And here's what I believe. Teachable people writing notes, write this down. Real faith, real faith is urgent faith. Real faith is urgent faith. Always. If you really believe it, the Bible says faith without works is dead. In other words, if we're not activating, it ain't going anywhere. We can't just talk about it. We have to be about it. And the Bible says he saw their faith and was amazed and then spoke. I want the type of faith that when God sees my faith, he moves on your behalf even when you don't have faith. Come on. I want the type of faith that as a parent, that even if my kids are are struggling in doubt, that my faith, that God still moves because he sees my faith, even if my kids are lacking in faith. That's the kind of faith we want. What What was it about their faith that amazed Jesus? And the last question is, what, what is it that should be urgent in my life that is not right now, and why? What is it that should be urgent in my life that's not right now? Because let's be honest, we're all busy people, right? So busy you can't say right. <laughs> but we're so busy, and, and it's like, we don't, sometimes we get so caught up in our to-do list that we forget what's urgent and important. What is it that needs to shift from the column that's not so, or, you know, when I talk to, I love our denomination. We're a part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And um, before in the, in, the, in the independent church realm, when we started Furban Church as an independent church, um, you know, we were only hanging out with, with my peers. I was only hanging out with pastors that were my age. And now I get to hang out and rub shoulders with pastors that are older than me. And, and whenever I get them one-on-one and I ask them, one-on-one and alone, like, get, tell me some things as you're, as you're on your way out, as you're about to retire, like, what are some things that you regret? What are some things that you wish you would have done better? And they all answer some kind of form or fashion in regards to the lack of urgency that they had to reach people. I, was like, I wish I cared less about the voting of my board and more about lost people. I wish I didn't tune my ear to the critics and the complainers in the church that I tuned my ear to God and kept on doing what he's called me to do. And you hear this over and over and over again. And what I personally hear is that they, they left things on their urgent list that should have been on their urgent list. Because passion is urgency. Who's with me this morning? So I want to talk about four things this morning that need to be urgent. You ready? Number one, there is an urgency to be in his presence. There's an urgency to be in his presence. The Bible says that he saw their faith. He saw their faith. And here's what I believe. The Bible doesn't say this, so I'm going to throw in that disclaimer. So all the Bible scholars, put your badges away. Put your degrees away from one second. I know that doesn't say this, but just think about it logically for a second. These four men had to know something about Jesus, right or wrong. If, if I heard that some crazy wackadoo is in town and he's healing people, I'm not bringing the people I love to them because I don't know you. I don't know what you're about, right? To go to that extreme, that extreme measure to get this paralyzed man to Jesus, they had to know something. So one of two things had to happen. Either they witnessed Jesus healing people or maybe they themselves were some of the people that Jesus healed prior to this. And to the point where they're like, they've been in the presence of God. They've experienced Jesus firsthand. And I love it. What what kind of pumps me up a little bit is that, like, this is how I know they've been with Jesus because I said, all we have to do, our responsibility is just to get him there. There was almost like a holy assumption that as long as we can get him there, God's going to do the rest. God's going to do the rest. That's the kind of faith they had. I know that they had an urgency to be in Jesus' presence, and to see that miracle firsthand, front row. They had to. And so here we see that they prioritized it. They had to prioritize it. And a lot of times, I don't want to speak all mystical when we talk about the presence of God. And at times we say that so cavalier, and we don't really define it. Because what does that mean? Because some of us in this room, we, 
we, when we say we feel the presence of God, it's like when we have the spiritual goosebumps, you know, the band gets loud around the bridge. It's always the bridge, right? And they punch it right into the chorus. That's when I feel the presence of God. The presence of God isn't just like a crescendo. It isn't just a, a moment in a song. It isn't, it, in fact, can I really be honest? It's, I love when we feel God's presence in service, but it's not limited to services. It's not. Our, our understanding of God's presence is that God is everywhere at all times. But when I say God's presence, it's when I have this complete awareness of my respect towards the king. I have a complete awareness of it, which means, you're ready for this one, it's about to get real applicable up in here, that I can feel God's presence, I don't know, in the DMV. Come on. I can feel God's presence in that boring business meeting that you have every Monday morning. I can feel God's presence when I'm in class and I'm bored out of my mind. I can feel God's presence in the middle of my dinner table when we're working out the bills and we're saying, where is it going to come from? Only Jesus. Right? I can feel God's presence anywhere. That's the potency of his presence. But at times, I don't, I'm not aware of that. It's almost like this. Let me make a parallel for you to understand the context of it. Because when you're talking about being in the presence of God, being in the presence of royalty, being in the presence of someone who's important, okay, So if a king of whatever country walked into this building, there'd be a level of like, ooh, there'd be an interest, right? There'd be a level of respect that that we would naturally give to that king. Am I right or wrong? We'd we'd observe. If I told you, yo, that's king, that's king so that's king so and so, that's king of Wakanda, right? Imagine if king of Wakanda, trying to make y'all y'all awake, right? Imagine if T'Challa came in right now, right? All of us. we stand up straight, wouldn't we? We'd be observant. We'd observe everything he would say. We'd absorb everything he'd say, right? That's the posture. And when we get into God, when, that is the posture of our hearts. When we're in God's presence, there's this reverence. There's this awe. There's this, like, receiving ability because we know that authority is in this place. And that's what these guys knew. They understood the authority because what was the conversation between Jesus and the scribes? It was a conversation about Jesus' authority. How is it? Jesus was like, yo, how trippy is this? These guys study the Bible and still don't know my authority. But these four knuckleheads who cut a hole in the roof, which we'll talk about later, understand Jesus' authority more than the scribes. Come on. They understood Jesus' authority more than the scribes. Why? Because I believe that there was an urgency to them about God's presence. And I think at times, when you start developing this urgency being in God's presence, not only do you become more aware of him, but you're constantly reminded of what he's done for you. Again, a miracle is a miracle. Look to the person next to you and say, a miracle is a miracle. And sometimes we come here on a Sunday, on a Sunday when we're, we're, we're shoulder to shoulder with other believers, and we forget that the miracle, the miracle that God has put on my life and it, it wasn't a miracle that, that, that he didn't multiply the dollar bills in my pocket. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't tell me to get up and walk, but the miracle of healing in my heart, the miracle of not stressing anymore because I know God's going to work it out somehow. And we forget, not only we're not aware of his presence, but we're also not aware of the miracles that God has already done in our lives. He's already done in our lives. So we, are you completely aware of your healing? Are you completely aware of your healing? And that can only be done by making his presence an urgent matter. Number two, there is an urgency to bring people to his presence. So again, it's like once you're in his presence, you don't want to be greedy. You want to bring people to his presence as well because it's so good. And if you're really in his presence, I don't believe that there's some people who've been hurt by the church and say, I love Jesus. I can't stand people. And trust me, I've said that about you, and you know who you are. (laughs) I'm kidding, by the way, right? You get an email. Why do you talk about me like that? It wasn't about you. You're so vain, you think this sermon's about you. (laughs) 
But, but what we do is like we, 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 we in, we're in God's presence, and, and the more I fall in love with Jesus, then I fall in love with the thing he loves, right? I fall in love with the things he loves, and he loves people. And so when he's done something in my life, I don't want to hoard that. He's an abundant God. He's never going to run out of it. So I'm blessed to be a blessing. And so these guys, they got something from God. They've been in God's presence. They experienced Jesus to some capacity that they did everything they possibly could to bring this paralyzed man to Jesus' feet. And here's the deal. Sometimes we barely even invite people to our communities. I say church, and I almost don't like that. We don't invite people to service because you are the church. Church isn't these pews. It's not this stage. It's not this mic. You are the church. Church equals people, not buildings. But we, don't even, we fail to even to invite people to service. Why? Because what we do is that we don't bring people to Jesus. We don't bring people to Jesus. We just pray for them. And I'm going to say something borderline heretical. Can I say this? Steve's like the guy that I look at for his approval. And if he's smiling, I'm good. He can just smile in the thumb, I'm all right. But I believe that sometimes we have substituted laziness for prayer. We've substituted laziness for prayer. Because God says, go and make disciples. The one prayer request he made is like, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. And then he said, pray for the workers. And how crazy is this, that Jesus' prayer request, we could be the answer to Jesus' prayer request. Because we are the workers. We, are, we could be the four guys who could bring the paralyzed man to Jesus and let Jesus do the rest. But what we've done is that we say, well, I'm just praying for this world. And I've seen it happen. Like I've, To this day, I get emails. Pastor, what are we going to do about this and that? What are we going to do? Like, we... We, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm not French. What is we? What are you going to do about it? I'm not in your schools. I'm not in your neighborhood. I'm not in your, at your business. I don't, I, don't, I don't clock in where you clock in. What are you going to do? Because last time I read the Bible that you received power from the Holy Spirit to be a witness to the uttermost place of this earth. You received that. And there is no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. You have the same Holy Spirit that I have. And we are commissioned to bring people to Jesus. But instead, no, I'm just going to pray for them. I'm just going to pray for somebody else to do it. Be somebody. Be somebody and stop substituting laziness for prayer. Preaching better than you're listening right now. Number three, there's an urgency to put your soul above your healing. To put your soul above your healing. I'm not just making this up, but if you see the, the progression in this, we see that Jesus came to him and said, your sins are forgiven. So watch this for a second, for a moment. We don't know how long. And if you ever got into an argument with a religious person, it was probably a long time. You ever get into an argument with a religious person? Probably a long time. But there was a moment where the man was paralyzed in his body while pardoned from his sins. Can I say that again? There was a moment where he was paralyzed in his body, yet pardoned from his sins. I'll say it a different way. There was a moment where he was physically sick, but spiritually whole. Y'all see this? I can't, I'm not making this up. Because all of a sudden, he's then, he didn't tell my man to get up and walk until after the conversation with the scribes. So there's this moment in this paralyzed man's life that he's sitting there and he's watching the conversation happen. Can you camera people get ready? I'm about to lay on the floor. He's sitting there. I warned you. He's sitting there paralyzed on his mat. Okay? Paralyzed on his mat. And then he sees his savior arguing with some religious people. What would you think, right? Every single person, you'd be like, hello. Excuse me. Um, what do I do now, Jesus? Because I, I want to worship you, but I, but I can't move my legs. 
By the way, no disrespect. Thank you for the sin thing, but what's up with the legs, though? Hello? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be your posture? No, I'm all dirty, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be your posture for a second? But Jesus was saying this, hey, I'm worried about the souls in this room. And isn't it crazy that Jesus was even trying to save the souls of even religious people? And he's arguing with them. He's questioning his heart. And he's, he, didn't, he didn't say get up and walk until the atmosphere was ready for everyone to worship. For everyone to worship. Why? Because he was more concerned with their souls than he was with their physical healing. And that's why there's moments in your life where you're like, come on, God, when is this, when am I going to have breakthrough in this area? But that's why we could stand up as believers and say, it is well within my soul, even though the situation is not lining up the way I want it to. Because he's more concerned with your soul than your situation. And to, we, there needs to be an urgency to put that above everything because here's the deal. You might feel paralyzed in any situation and still be whole. And still be whole as long as you prioritize and put an urgency on your soul. Number four and last one. There needs to be an urgency to put more of a focus on the authority of Jesus than our sin. More of a focus on the authority of Jesus than sin. Here's the trippy part about this. They were so caught up, the scribes were so caught up with the issue of sin. They were so caught up with the topic of sin that they missed out on the authority of Jesus. They missed out that we talk about the issues, but remember the issue belongs to a person. Right? We focus more on the issue, but the issue came in with a person. We forget the person and focus on the issue. And there were two people that deserved the focus at the time. It was the paralyzed man and it was Jesus. And if you could focus on loving people, but also being focused on the authority of Jesus, we wouldn't be so complex and so, uh, you know, frustrated with our society and frustrated with like, is this right? Is that right? Is this wrong? Is that wrong? And we always get those questions as pastors and leaders. Can I tell you something? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you understand the authority of Jesus. We're always trying to figure things out. Well, is this right? Is that right? And listen, at some degree, yes, we have to have that conversation, but we're looking at this world and you cannot protect yourself from someone you're trying to save. Y'all get this. You can't protect yourself from somewhere you're going to. So they were talking about, oh, sins. You can't forgive sins. You can't do that and everything like that. Instead of saying, what is it about this man? What is the revelation I need to have about this man that could forgive sins? And we, we have this feeling sometimes. Religious has told us that sin will stop you from interfering with God. Sin will, will hinder you from your, from, from your destiny. And sin will do this and sin will do that. I've seen a lot of my heroes of faith fall incredibly hard when it comes to, came to their sin. But this is one thing I know, that wherever sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Grace abounds all the more. And our focus is the potency of sin. Is sin jacked up? Yes. Is sin hurting our fellow man, absolutely. Is sin robbing us from certain things? Yes. But one thing I do know, I do not care about how devastating that is. I know that there's nothing that God can't heal, fix, or grow. Nothing that God can't heal, fix, or grow. And they missed out on that, and Jesus was right there. Right there, and they missed out on that. Only until he said, get up and walk. And I believe Jesus kind of set the whole thing up, if I'm honest. He's like, I'm going to teach you something, I'm going to teach them something, and I'm going to teach this boy something. That at the end of the day, I have authority over all things. I have authority over everything. And we're so focused on like, oh, these topics and these issues where we forget about people. I get it all the time. Pastor, who should we vote for? Pastor, are you... Pro-life, pro-choice, pastor, what about this issue? Pastor, what about that issue? Here's bottom line. I just want to love people and let Jesus deal with the rest. Number one, it's way above my pay grade. Number two, I try to fix people and I can't do it. I suck at it. So what can I do in my power? What can I do? Love them 
and let God deal with the rest. Because you want to know why? Somebody loved me and, and, and introduced me to my Savior, and Jesus did the rest of my life. Anything, anytime a person tries to change you, it never sticks anyway. Sometimes the only thing that really changes you is the power of God and the Holy Spirit moving on your life. I've had people preach to me all my life, but it wasn't until Jesus got me on my knees that I made a change. And I think we miss out on that. We're so focused on sin and this and that, and we forget about the authority of Jesus. That Jesus can forgive any sin. Any sin? Any sin. And here's the deal. When there's urgency, urgency shaves off stuff that doesn't matter. I wonder if 50% of our stress is related to things that shouldn't matter in our lives. Now, if my wife stops crying, you know, stops being the boy who cried wolf, and when she cries out for me, and I run to her, if I spill coffee or move furniture or mess up my shirt, and she's really in danger, guess what? That level of urgency, none of those other things matter. I could care less about my clothes. I could care less about my furniture. I could care less about whatever I break in order to get to my wife, right? And I think in the same way, urgency helps us shave off things that don't matter. Style of worship shouldn't matter. What you wear shouldn't matter. The urgent thing is this, is to be in God's presence and to bring people to God's presence. And to, to, to get my soul checked with the Lord and then allow God to check other people's souls so that we could get to a place of wholeness and, and healing that we've never experienced so that people, when they encounter this community of believers, they could say, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that before. That is the type of passion. That is the type of urgency that will not only help you out, but help out the people right next to you. But we have to start living in an urgent life. And then you start realizing, this stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It doesn't matter. You know, at the 9 a.m. service, we had a technical difficulty during worship, and the words were messed up, and, uh, you know, something happened with the sound. And in the past, if I'm honest with you, it would bother me, like, oh, come on, we just ruined someone's experience, and this and that and whatever, whatever. And I know that EJ was up here. He was probably beating himself up. Maybe I'm putting words in his mouth, but he probably beat himself up. And it was just funny. I just said, you know what? It really doesn't matter. His presence is not that fragile. His presence is not that fragile. It really isn't. Because if, if I could experience God's presence in my bedroom with my laundry everywhere and snot bubbles coming out my nose, and then I can experience his presence even in a nice professional looking place like this, it doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. But if we urgently pursue God, just urgently pursue God, and then urgently bring people to Jesus, I know our passion will change this world. 